Hi, welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2. Intermediate Financial Accounting 1, the prerequisite to this course, focused on the recognition and measurement of a variety of assets. Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 will focus on the other side of the balance sheet, the recognition and measurement of a variety of liabilities, equity, and a variety of other complex areas of accounting. Today, we're gonna to kick off our first lecture for Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 by talking about liabilities. We'll understand what a liability is, what a financial versus a non-financial liability is, and we'll look at the accounting for some common liabilities. Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 is a challenging course. Why? Each chapter covers a variety of complex areas and the tutorial questions can be quite in-depth. For this reason, I will break down each lecture into a variety of components. After each component is completed, there will be a tutorial video where I will walk through questions related to that specific area of accounting. For chapter 13, we have nine learning objectives. Let's get started. Learning objective one, understand the importance of liabilities from a business perspective. Liabilities are important from a business perspective because they're related to cash flow. Cash flow is a key control factor for most companies. Control of our expenses can greatly impact the efficiency of a business. Prompt payment to suppliers can decrease our cash outflows and potentially increase our net income. Management of liabilities is increasingly important during an economic downturn. Companies need to ensure they have enough cash inflows to meet their upcoming obligations. Learning objective number two, define liabilities, distinguish financial liabilities from non-financial liabilities and identify how they are measured. First of all, what is a liability? For a liability to exist, all three of the following criteria must be satisfied. Number one, the entity has an obligation or a present duty or responsibility that it has no practical ability to avoid. For instance, if it tried to avoid the liability, it may be sued for breach of contract. Number two, the obligation has at least the potential to require an economic resource to be transferred to another party. Why do we say at least the potential? Well, let's use the example of a lawsuit. You may win a lawsuit, you may lose a lawsuit. You don't know if it's gonna require the transfer of economic resources to another party. So the fact that there is uncertainty around that lawsuit doesn't prevent it from being classified as a liability. And we will learn more about that as we talk about contingencies later in this chapter. Number three, the obligation exists as a result of past transactions or events. Basically, the company already received the goods, for instance, therefore it must pay for them. Liabilities can arise because of a variety of reasons. There may be a contract, there may be a law, or there may be a constructive obligation. What's a constructive obligation? Well, a constructive obligation is created by a company's past practice of accepting a certain responsibility, which creates the expectation that this will continue. For instance, let's think about Walmart's return policy. On the receipt, it may state that Walmart will only take returns and exchanges up to 30 days. But in practice, if Walmart accepts returns and exchanges up to 90 days, then they've created a constructive obligation with their consumers that returns and exchanges will be accepted up to 90 days. And when creating a provision for returns and exchanges, they would need to consider the 90 day period. Liabilities can also result from a variety of laws and regulations. However, in most situations, the liability only occurs if the law or regulation has been violated. So now that we know what a liability is, now we need to know what a financial liability is. So up here we have a liability 
And underneath that, we have a financial liability or a non-financial liability. So what is the distinction? A financial liability must be established by a contract. And it's going to be either the requirement to deliver cash or financial assets to another entity or to exchange assets or financial liabilities with another entity under conditions that are potentially unfavorable. It's important to remember that a financial liability must be contractual. And liabilities that are created by legislation and not contract, such as income taxes payable, are not financial liabilities. How do we measure a financial liability? Financial liabilities are initially measured at fair value, but generally speaking, they're subsequently measured at amortized cost. Consistent with amortized cost measurement, we can capitalize transaction costs at acquisition, but transaction costs after acquisition are expensed through the income statement. In practice, short-term liabilities, such as trade or accounts payable, are usually accounted for at the invoice's face value. For the, and the reason for this is that the difference between the face value and the, and the present value would be immaterial. A non-financial liability is the opposite of a financial liability. So it's not payable in cash and it's usually met through the delivery of goods or services. Non-financial liabilities can be more challenging to measure than financial liabilities. How do we measure non-financial liabilities? Well, ultimately IFRS provides a lot more detail here than ASCII, which doesn't provide a lot of detail on how to measure non-financial liabilities. But ultimately they're often measured at present value, some sort of an expected value or probability average of possible outcomes some sort of a scenario analysis or timing and the timing and the amount of the liability are not usually fixed. Learning objective number three, define current liabilities and identify and account for common types of current liabilities. Well, what is a current liability? Well, when we think about liabilities, classification is important. So when we classify a liability, we need to think about when it is due. Short-term maturity places a demand on current assets and distant due dates do not. For this reason, we separate current assets from non-current assets to show how working capital is used. A current liability is a liability where any one of the following conditions is met. It's either it's expected to be settled within the normal operating cycle, or it's normally held for trading, or it's due within 12 months from the end of the reporting period, and or there's no unconditional right to defer the settlement for at least 12 months after the date of the statement of financial position. So essentially, if we aren't certain that the liability is going to be due in more than 12 months, it will be classified as current. Now let's look at the accounting for some common current liabilities. Bank indebtedness. This is a very common li current liability. And this is a line of credit or revolving debt arrangement. So oftentimes companies will establish a line of credit with a bank where they can keep lending up to a certain limit. They can repay it and lend and borrow again, repay and borrow again. So it's a re revolving facility. In order to set up this type of facility, there's usually collateral required and some restrictions are set. In terms of what we would report on the statement of the financial position, the draw as at the statement of financial position date would be recorded in current assets and any restrictions imposed would be, uh, would be disclosed in the notes. Accounts payable. This is probably the most current common liability. And this is where we record amounts due for goods, supplies, or services related to the entity's ordinary business activities. And we say that it's because they're purchased on open account. What that means is that 
each invoice establishes the, the value of the goods that are due rather than it being under one contract. This liability arises because of the time lag between the receipt of the goods and the payment for them. And the liability for the payment is, is recorded when the title passes. So normally when the goods are received. Notes payable. So notes payable are written promises to pay a sum of money on a specific future date. And they often arise from purchases or financing transactions. They may be classified as either current or long-term dependent on their due date. And they can be interest bearing or not zero interest bearing or non-interest bearing. Regardless of whether the note has explicit interest or not, interest expense must be accrued regardless of when cash payments are made, as at the date of financial state, the statement of financial position. So let's just talk a little bit about zero interest bearing notes because this can be a little bit more complicated. Just a reminder that for zero interest bearing notes, the difference between the present value of the note and the face value of the note represents the interest. And the interest expense is recorded over the life of the note. Let's look at a quick example. So in this example, Hanson Bank agrees to lend 250,000 to Mission Corp on May 1st, 2020. And the company signs a 250,000 three-year 6% note maturing on August 1st, 2020. And we're asked to prepare the journal entry to record the cash received by Mission Corp on May 1st, the entry to record the interest expense at Mission's year end of July 31st, and the entry at maturity of the note. So let's think about May 1st. When the company agrees, when the company receives the 250,000, they're gonna record debit cash so they're receiving a cash inflow of 250,000 and credit notes payable. So we're establishing a liability for notes payable on our balance sheet. July 31st, when we need to accrue the interest expense, we're going to calculate the interest expense that was due. So we know we have a $250,000 note at 6%. However, 6% is an annual interest rate. And we only have three months. So May, June, July, three months. So we need to take three over 12. So the interest due as at July 31st is $3,750. We're gonna debit interest expense for 3,750 and we're gonna credit interest payable. So we're setting up a liability for interest payable of $3,750 of $3, on our balance sheet. As at August 1st, when the note is due, we're going to remove the note payable, the liability for the note payable, payable from our statement of financial position. So here we're debiting note payable, we're removing the interest payable, debiting interest payable, removing that liability, and we're going to settle the entire liability in cash, where we're going to give back $253,750. So we can see that even though this was a non-interest bearing note, the company originally received 250,000 and it paid back 253,750. So the interest that was paid on the note was this $3,750. The next common area of accounting is the maturity of long-term debt. So the portion of long-term debt maturing within 12 months from the date of this financial position is recorded as a current liability. Portions of long-term debt should not be reported as current liabilities if, by contract, they are retired by assets not classified as current assets. So if you're planning to use a long-term asset to satisfy it, then you would not need to reclassify it as current. Any liability due or demand, due on demand, within a year or operating cycle, even if its payment is due over a number of years is reported as a current liability. So even if you believe that you're gonna have that liability on your books for three years, if it's due on demand, it must be recorded as current. And if long-term debt's violated and becomes payable on demand, then that debt would also be classified as current. 
what about short-term debt expected to be refinanced? So you have some short-term debt on your, on your statement of financial position, but you know that you're planning to refinance it under a long-term agreement. Do you still have to show it as current or could you show it as long-term? Short-term obligations class are classified as current, except if they are expected to be refinanced on a long-term basis and no current assets will be required to settle it. Under IFRS, debt due within 12 months is classified as current. Under ASPE, currently maturing debt can be classified as long-term if there is refutable evidence, irrefutable evidence when the financial statements are issued, not at the statement of financial reporting date, but when the financial statements are issued, which could be months later, that the debt has been or will be converted to a long-term obligation. So this is a really important difference between IFRS and ASPE. So let's just go over that again. So under IFRS, debt within due within 12 months, it's current. No question. ASPE is a little bit easier. It says, well, it could be classified as long-term if by the time you issue the statements, you know that it will be converted to a long-term obligation. So let's take a look at an example here. So assume a company has $3 million of short-term debt at the reporting date, after the balance sheet date, but before the financial statement were, are issued, the company refinances $2 million of the debt under a long-term agreement. What value of the debt would be classified as short-term on the statement of financial position? Under IFRS or ASPE? So remember that under ASPE, you, you are allowed to wait until you issue the financial statements to determine what debt was short-term and what debt was long-term. So because they originally had 3 million of debt and they refinanced 2 million, they only have 1 million left that's short-term. So ASPE would only require the 1 million be classified as short-term. However, under IFRS, IFRS doesn't care that months later, some of the short-term debt was refinanced into long-term debt. IFRS says that as at the date of the statement of financial position, you had 3 million of debt that was currently short, that was short term at that time. Therefore, you will report 3 million of debt on that, of current debt on that date. All right, let's move into the next area. So dividends payable. There are a variety of different types of dividends. So you can have a cash dividend payable, which is an amount a corporation owes to its shareholders because the board has authorized dividends. And this is generally paid within three months. Therefore, it is classified as a current liability. Preferred dividends in arrears. These are not a liability until the distribution is authorized. And if the distribution is not authorized, then this must be disclosed in the note. You can also have share or stock dividends, but because these do not require the payment of cash, they're not recognized as a liability. Rent and royalties payable. This type of a liability may, create, may be created by a contractual agreement in which payments are conditional on the amount of revenue that's earned or the quantity of product that is produced. So examples would be where a franchisee pays the French or French franchisor a fee that's based on the percentage of sales, or your rent is based on your the sales in the store, or the manufacturers have to pay the holder of a patent of royalty for each item produced. In, in most situations, this is a calculation that can be done because as long as you know the base, you can do the math to figure out what the royalty payable would be. Moving on, customer advances and deposits. So customers may pay deposits that guarantee the payment of future expected obligations. These are classified as current or non-current depending on the specific conditions attached to the deposit. If the settlement of the deposit cannot be deferred for a period of more than 12 months, from the statement of financial position date, it is not reported as a current liability. Tax. 
So there's a variety of tax. So PST, let's talk about that first. So sales tax. So in some provinces, in BC specifically, uh, sales tax is applied to transfers of tangible property and certain services. The liability represents the sales taxes that have been collected from customers, but have, but have not been remitted to the government. So they're due to the government. And this is usually applied to the sale amount. GST, another type of tax. Most businesses in Canada are subject to goods and services tax of 5%. And GST is charged by each taxable entity. So businesses pay GST, but they also charge GST. And the net of these two accounts is what is remitted to the government. And the net amount is what is also reported on the statement of financial position as a current liability or a current asset if you're expecting to get a refund back. And some provinces in the East charge harmonized sales tax, which is accounted for in the same way as GST. Income tax, so corporations are charged federal and provincial income tax on their taxable income. And since, ta since income tax returns are generally finalized after the financial statements have been issued, companies generally estimate the total amount of income tax payable. Income taxes payable are reported as a current liability. And CRA amounts are charged, to, are charged through current operations unless it was an obvious error, in which case it would be required to flow through retained earnings. That concludes the first part of our lecture for chapter 13. Let's pause here and look at some tutorial questions. <laughs>